So there will be an, a, a, an induced current that will result in a force acting on that bar that you're pulling that, and a force that's directed in the opposite direction that you're pulling, right? And when that force acting on the bar to the left as a result of the induced current equals the force with which you're pulling to the right, then the sum of the forces on that bar is going to be zero. And when the sum of the forces acting on the bar is zero, the acceleration is zero. And that means that the bar is gonna move with constant velocity. And that will be the terminal velocity. Okay? So, um, so the, the magnetic field in this region is into the page, or into the board, into the screen over here, right? So there's a uniform magnetic field directed into the page. The length of this bar is L. Uh, these are conducting rails over here. You grab this bar and you want to pull it with a constant force, right? Um, the terminal velocity will be when the, when the velocity is constant, right? Uh, but the velocity will be constant when the force which is constant with which you're pulling is equal to the force acting in the opposite direction. Um, exerted by the external magnetic field on the bar. So if the current induced is up the bar, and since the external magnetic field is into the page, then I cross B will be to the left. So the magnetic force will be the length of the bar times the induced current times the uh, magnetic field. The external magnetic field, right? And uh, so the induced current is the EMF given by the resistance of that loop, uh, and you plug that in. So here you have the expression for the net force on the bar. It will be the mass times the acceleration. So you're pulling to the right, so that's this force. This is the constant force that you exert. And then the magnetic force exerted by the magnetic field, magnetic force, because it is exerted by the magnetic field, that's to the left, so that's negative. This is some the x component of the forces. So the force to the right that you pull with, that force exerted by the magnetic field to the left, and that's that. And that's equal to m dv dt, right? Ah. Uh, so um, actually, um, To get, them, to get the magnetic force uh, to be equal to the force with which you're pulling so that the acceleration is zero, at this point right here, where is it? Uh, right here. See that line right there? Mm -hmm. F equals F minus B squared L squared times B divided by R is equal to M dV dt, right? So when the V D T is equal to zero, the, um, the velocity will be the terminal velocity. Right? So you just take this. And that will be this minus V squared, L squared, V terminal of R will be zero. So the terminal velocity will be F R over V squared, L squared. That's the answer for the terminal velocity. But the thing is that in this problem, the other question was find V as a function of time. Mm -hmm. So before the object gets to this velocity, right? I mean, you know, um, here's the bar of length L. Somebody's pulling this way a certain force, which is constant, right? And there will be a magnetic force this way. And the magnetic force will be the length of the bar. Maybe I should use the other L so you don't think of this as inductance. So the magnitude of the magnetic force will be L times the magnetic field times, um, times L uh, I. Um, 
is it? Uh, well, I equals B, right? Okay. And then, uh, so where did I? Well, I, I see that I used some results from a previous page, from a previous problem. Um, I see that I used some results from a previous problem. So anyway, uh, this is equal to L, and uh, the current is the EMF divided by the resistance. But the EMF uh, is, um, what is it, uh, B, B, um, L, is it? I don't memorize these expressions. Yep, VBL. So um, this becomes L of R times B times this, which is this. So I'll be L V B. So this is just B squared, L squared, B over R. So that'll be when, when the velocity is to the right is V. Now if the velocity is the terminal velocity, the acceleration will be zero, the net force will be zero, and then that velocity will be the terminal velocity. So if I call this the terminal velocity so that the acceleration is zero, then this force will be B squared, L squared times the terminal velocity divided by R. And since the acceleration is zero, then this force has to be equal in magnitude to this. So if you equate those two, you just said V squared, L squared, V terminal over R equals F. And then you solve for V terminal, and you have F R over V squared, L squared, right? Which is that result over there. So, in physics 185, you solve this problem. Suppose I take an object, suppose I take an object, right? and I, it's got a mass m, and I, you know, it's way up in altitude, uh, and there's air, right, between the object and the ground, and I just drop it. So as it falls and falls and falls, um, you know, there's a force of gravity acting downward, so you would have, uh, here's the object, let's say at t is equal to zero, right? the initial speed is zero, uh, the force acting on it is the force of gravity, right? so the acceleration at that instant is just g downwards, right? When I, when I, when I, as soon as I let go, this acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared downwards. As time goes on, as time goes on, a little later, you're still going to have the force of gravity, but because now it's moving, now it's moving at some speed, right? Uh, there will be a frictional force this way. It's called air friction. So there will be a frictional force, air friction, or air drag, as it's called, at some later time t, right? Now, at this point, the ac acceleration will be, will it be equal to g, will it be less than g, or will it be more than g? What do you think? Less than G. I mean, anyway, Less than G. It's falling, right? But in addition to the force of gravity acting downwards, there is an air frictional force acting upward. So the net force is less, so the acceleration will be less. So the acceleration is going to be less than G. Um, let's say here it's 9.8 meters per second squared downwards, and here it might be 8 meters per second squared downwards, right? So, something like that. As what happens with the force of friction is that the force actuated by the air drag is that it is proportional to how fast this object is moving. So the faster it moves, the bigger this air frictional force is going to be. Right? Uh, so if, if the force of friction is modeled as you know, some constant multiplied by V, and usually you put a sign like that, then here the magnitude of that force will be K times V. Later on, you know, even later, 
I'll just say even later, right? The speed is going to be whatever. The weight is still there. The force of, the force of friction over here, because it fell an, an extra distance, and it was also speeding up still, the acceleration is going to be less, but the speed is going to be bigger. So this air friction of force is going to be bigger. So what will happen is that at that instant, the acceleration will be, well, it will be less than that. Let's say it's two meters per second squared downwards. Right? But it's still speeding up because the acceleration, it, it, it still has an acceleration, so it's still speeding up, right? Later on, after some time, uh, time t is going to have a speed v, right? You still have the force of gravity acting, but now you have this air track. And what happens if this force of friction is now equal to mg? The magnitude of it would be, you know, that constant times the terminal speed, right? And uh, if this air track force is equal to mg, then the acceleration is zero, and then the speed of the object is called the terminal, the terminal speed. And from then on, from that height on, it's going to move at constant speed. And that's called the terminal speed. That's when the acceleration is zero, which is when, when the net force is zero because the magnitude of this is equal to that. So you can figure out what the terminal speed is going to be by simply saying that, you know, at, at V equals the terminal speed, the sum of the forces is zero because the acceleration is zero. But you have the air drive force, which is K times V terminal minus mg equals zero. So the terminal speed will just be the weight divided by that constant K. And it's pretty much what's, it's the same over here, right? You start pulling this thing to the right, when you start pulling this bar to the right, um, the, the current is going to be small. In this bar, the current is going to be this way in the problem that we're solving. The induced current is going to be this way, and there will be a magnetic force acting to the left. Right? And it will speed up, speed up, speed up, until it reaches a speed, which is the constant speed, and when the speed is constant, the acceleration is zero. But the only way for the acceleration to be zero is when the force with which you pull is equal to the magnetic force in the opposite direction so that the sum of the forces is zero, so that the acceleration is zero. So that the speed is constant, and that's called the terminal speed. So the question is, what is the expression? This is constant, this was given in this problem. The question is, what is this force exerted by the magnetic field on this bar that you're pulling to the right? Well, the force is going to be given by this expression. You know, that comes from F equals Li cross B. So that's this expression here. But the current, this is the induced current in the bar. From Ohm's law, the current is the induced voltage divided by the resistance of the loop. So you take that, and that's this, right? And you plug it in there. And then the next question becomes, well, what is the induced EMF? There was no induced EMF given in this problem. So what is it? And actually that, actually that is something that we derived um, in class. And I just pulled that result instead of having to do it all over again. Uh, originally we said that the, if we had a loop like this with a bar of length L, right? And this is a uh, um, conducting rails and you have this magnetic field going into the, the page, right? We said that the length of this bar is L, right? and I call this distance X, and so the magnetic flux to this loop is the magnetic field multiplied by that area, which is L times X. And the EMF is the derivative of that flux with respect to time. The minus sign is just in there for us to figure out the direction of the current. And this would be B L D X D T. But the X D T, right, the rate at which this distance X is changing, that's just the speed. So this would be B L V. And that's what I have over here. Right? So 
instead of having to do this problem again in this problem, uh, I just pull the result, connect it with Ohm's law over here, right? And then put that in the magnetic force, and then just set the, for the speed over here, right, of this bar, which depends, th this magnetic force depends on that speed, just set it equal to the terminal speed, and by setting this force equal to that, the thing has terminal velocity. Now, you said, see, like in this problem, before the object reaches the terminal speed, the question is what is V as a function of time? And that's the one, that, that's when you have to write F equals MA, like then you say this, and then you would say MG minus KV equals MDV DT, and then you separate variables and you do the integral. And you said that's when you had some issues? So let's do that. But to answer the question about the terminal speed, there's no need to do the integral or, or any of that. So let me show you what was done. So, So the net force acting on the object, right, the bar is the force that you pull with, that one F, minus the magnetic force, which I showed is given to, is given by P squared, L squared. I don't, I don't memorize this expression. I, it's something that I have to. I start with the force is L I B, then I, the current is the EMF voltage divided by R. And then the EMF is just that other result that, you know. So you put that over here, right? But so you have this minus that force equals m dv dt. Now, I, I was kind of lazy. I didn't like, I didn't want to carry all of this b squared, l squared, but R all over the place. So I just gave it a, you know, a, a name. I just called it alpha. So I wouldn't have, like in this problem over here, this is called k. That k is like that alpha. And so uh, I just called it alpha just so that I would have a you know shorthand notation. And then this is f over m minus, well, f minus alpha v equals m dv dt. And then if I divide by m, right, uh, notice that this quantity divided by m is what I defined by alpha, and then I have f over m. So at this point, I just uh, separate variables. Um, And you don't have to do it like that, like I did it over there. Let me show you how I did this algebra. In fact, let me not look how I did it over there, because there's more than one way of doing this. So I have F over M minus alpha v equals dv dt, right? And I'm trying to get to an expression where I have v by itself. And so how about I factor out alpha over here? Then this will be f over m alpha, right? Because if I multiply this by this, I'm going to get this term, right? Minus v equals dv dt, right? Yes? And notice that these are constants, right? Because alpha was defined as what? b square, l square, m, r. All of those are constants. So this quantity is a constant, right? So then what I can do is I can bring this over here and I can bring this dt over there. So that would be alpha dt equals dv and then I have all of that. In fact, at this point, you might want to call this f over m alpha, you might want to call it beta or something so you don't call that or you know, carry that around. Yes? And then, uh, I mean, I would call it like beta, but no, I guess I didn't do that, so I'll just 
continue with this. So now you integrate both sides of this. Now alpha is a constant, right? So I can pull that outside right away and then have a dt, and then I have a dv, then f over m alpha minus v. Integral, correct? So um, you said you wanted me to go through the math of this, right? So let me do it again. Please stop me if I write something that doesn't make sense. Or that you don't follow. Or if I make a mistake on the point. Right? Okay. Um, here. Alpha dt, right? Equals uh, dv f over m alpha minus v integral, right? So at t is equal to zero, what was the initial speed of this thing, of this ball? Zero. It was zero, right? I think it started from rest. I think this vector is not good. And then at a time t, this is going to be v, right? So this would be. Um, this left hand side is just going to be alpha t equals this integral, right? So here I let, for example, u be f over m alpha minus v, and then the u dv is minus 1, right? Because this is a constant. All of these are constant minus, right? Yes? So this dv is minus the u. So I take this and I plug it in here. And then this over here is u. So this becomes the integral of dv, which is minus the u. And I can put the minus sign outside. And then this is just u. In fact, I can bring this one over here. So, but for now, I'll just leave it there. So this will be minus the natural log of u which is minus the natural log of, what was my substitution for u? It was this, right? So that's f over m alpha minus v. Are we good? Now I have to evaluate this at the limits of integration. So this is from v equals zero to some later time v. So at this point, I have uh, alpha times t. How about I move that minus sign and I put it here instead? Yes, are we good? So this would be the natural log of f over m alpha minus v minus the natural log. That is, I got to take this and plug it in there. And now this plugged in there. So this is f over m alpha minus zero, which is just, just that. And this would be the natural log of, like you have the, natu the natural log of something minus the natural log of something else. Like the natural log of A minus the natural log of B is the natural log of A over B. So I just use that. Right? So this would be uh, all of this over all of this. Now, this divided by that is 1. And this divided by that will be m alpha over fv. Okay? This, is a, this goes to the numerator. And all of this is minus alpha t. Right? Which is this. So. Um, let's see, let me use another color so that I can use the board over here, so. So, minus alpha t equals the natural log of one minus m alpha v over f. So, 
you have this rule also, right? The natural log of A equals B, that means, that means this base, E raised to that, is equal to the argument. So that means E raised to that is equal to the argument. And now solve for B. So I will bring this term over here, and I'll bring this term over there. So that becomes m alpha v over f equals, when I bring this over here, then I'll have one minus that. And then um, solve for v, so v will be f over m alpha, one minus e to the minus alpha t. But now I have to plug in what alpha is, because that's something that didn't exist, right? Alpha is this. I mean, that was something that I included to make the algebra, you know, less wordy. So this would be, and then alpha, I call it b square, l square over mr, the mass of the bar, r is the resistance of it, and then all of this is times e to the one minus e, e to the minus alpha, which is b squared, l squared over mrt. And I can see that this mass will cancel that, and the r is gonna go upstairs. So I should get like r f over b squared, l squared, one minus e to the minus b squared l squared over mr t. Now, remember what was the expression that I had? I can say that, how can I get the terminal velocity? From here, right? If I write f over m minus alpha multiplied by the terminal velocity, if this velocity is the terminal velocity, then this acceleration is zero. So that means that the terminal velocity is going to be f over m alpha, which will be f over m, and then alpha is this. So that'll be b squared l squared over mr. So this m cancels that. So the terminal velocity equals rf over b squared l squared, right? So with this definition, I can, and that's, that's precisely this. I can write down the terminal velocity, the velocity as a function of time as the terminal velocity multiplied by one minus e to the minus b squared l squared over mr, all of that times t. And you can write it like this. Where the terminal velocity is this expression here obtained from the f equals ma equation by setting the acceleration equal to zero. And I would have, like at this point, you know, instead of calling F or M, I would have called that beta. It, it, it just, and then at the end, you just plug whatever you define beta as. Yeah. Is this something we could expect to see on the exam? Why not? <laughs> like, can you do the problem of the, finding the terminal velocity of something moving through air if the force of, gra of if the air drag is proportional to the speed. It's really the same problem as this, which is why I assigned this problem because it shows you, once again, how to do that type of problem that you did, if you did it, right, in physics 185, where you calculate the speed of an object that's falling through the air, encountering air friction, where the air friction of force is modeled as being proportional to the speed of the object. There's another problem where the air friction of force is modeled as being proportional to the square of the speed of the problem. And that one I set it as a, as a homework problem. But the other one is done in my notes. Um, so, you know, it's, 
it's really the same idea. You, you're talking about a terminal speed. So what's the physics behind that? It's called the terminal speed because when the object reaches that speed, the speed is not going to increase anymore. The object increases in speed from in both of these problems from zero, the, you know, the object in free fall, but actually not in free fall, because with air friction, it wouldn't be free falling anymore. So the object falling through the air, you know, experiencing air drag, air friction, um, in that case, the object starts from rest, and it doesn't have to start from rest. Like, you know, if it starts at something, if at t is equal to zero, the speed is something different, then you just call this, you know, V0, and you just carry that around, right? But in both of those problems, in this problem where you grab this bar and you pull it to the left, uh, as you pull it to the left, um, the, um, there's going to be a force acting to the, as you pull it to the right, there's going to be a force uh, showing up in the opposite direction so that you don't pull it, and that's really like a frictional force, magnetic friction if you want to call it that, right? And um, it's, it's keeping you from, it's attempting to keep you from pulling that bar to the right. So it's like friction kicks in, uh, but that force is proportional to the speed. It's related to the speed. And uh, when, that, when, 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 when the bar reaches that terminal speed, then that's when the acceleration of the bar is going to be zero, which means the bar is not going to speed up anymore. That's called the terminal speed, right? And uh, if you set the magnetic force, the magnitude of it, equal to the force that you're pulling with, and you solve for the speed, you get the terminal speed. Which is this, right? To do that part, you don't really need, you just need F equals MA, kind of, and then, well, I guess I erased it. I'm sorry, I erased it. But you can just set DVDT, the acceleration equal to zero, and it's very simple to figure out the terminal speed. What's more of a challenge is to figure out what the speed of the object is as a function of time before it reaches the terminal speed, when it's still accelerating. Um, and that's, that, that's when you do this integral. But look, you should all know how to do an integral like this, like dx you know, equals 3 minus x. Essentially, that's what you're doing here, right? What you call x over here is this v, right? If you like, you can call that x, and you can call this x, and this is just a number, like 3, like 7, like 15. It's just a, a, an integral like this you should all know how to do. Or at least, you know, what you, know, you make a substitution, and that's what I've done over here. Maybe what looks weird about this problem is that instead of having a three over there, and you right away you recognize that as a constant, you know, it's f or m or alpha, and that may throw you off. But it's just a constant. And then you, you, know, you solve the integral, and then you end up with some difference of natural logs, and you use that identity, right? natural log of A minus natural log of B is the natural log of A over B. But then when you do that, you end up with an expression like, um, where is it? Like over here. How do you solve for this thing in the argument of the natural log function, right? How do you solve for that? Well, that quantity is the base raised to what you have on the other side, to that power. So, e raised to the minus alpha t is this. And then you just, you know, solve for me. So that's the other rule that, that you need to know. But the rest is just algebra.